Same thing, right? Wrong. No. Though envy and jealousy are synonyms, there is a subtle difference. And you need to know the difference. In fact, let me define each term and let's see if you notice the difference. Here's envy. All right, let's start off. God is good? And all the time? Yes, all the time. Doesn't matter what you're going through. Listen to me, God is good. He's not the cause of the bad things you're going through. In fact, God can turn those bad things into things that are good if you love him and are called according to his purpose. Yeah, that's what the Bible says. Anyways, last week I taught on the subject of love and more specifically the characteristics of love. You see, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 8, Paul described what true love is. And what I mean by true love is agape love. We sometimes refer to it as the God kind of love because it's the type of love that God loves us with. I want you to notice how Paul describes true love. We're going to read this passage of scripture. But as we're reading through this, I want you to see and I want you to notice that true love, agape love, is not a feeling. It's a choice. It's a decision to love in word and deed. So notice this. Love is patient. Doesn't make you feel patient. It is patient. Love is kind. It doesn't make you feel like you want to be kind, but love is kind. In fact, you're kind when you don't want to be kind. It is not jealous. It does not brag. It's not arrogant. It does not act unbecomingly. That's an interesting word. When we get to it, you're going to enjoy that part. It does not seek its own. It is not provoked. It does not take into account a wrong suffered. It does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. You know, I'll stop right here and just put a little comment in here. You know, one of the um, allegations made towards Christians is that we're not tolerant, that we don't truly love, we preach love, but we don't actually practice love. And people, that's not true. I just want you to understand something. Love does not rejoice in unrighteousness. I told both of my girls when they were teenagers, there's not a thing you can ever do that would make me stop loving you. But that does not mean I will approve of what you're doing. There are certain things that are wrong and you should not be doing it. And if you do that, I will be sorely disappointed in you. But rest assured, I will never stop loving you. Well, Dad, love is... Whoa, whoa. Love does not rejoice in unrighteousness. Love rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. Now, in these five verses, Paul listed 16 characteristics of love. And when I started this series, I thought I could cover at least four characteristics a week. I always think I can cover more material than I actually can. But last week, I only made it through two of the characteristics, and I was halfway through the third when I ran out of time. The two I covered were the two most important characteristics, which are the first and the last on the list. Love is patient, and love never fails. I know that those are the two most important because whenever Paul makes a list, the first item on the list and the last item on the list are the most important. That's because Paul likes to start with the bang and end with the climax. So it doesn't matter what list you're reading. If Paul wrote the list, you need to know this. The first item on the list and the last item on the list are the most important because Paul likes to start with the bang and end with the climax. So, most scholars agree that whenever you see a list by Paul, you need to pay close attention to the first item on the list and the last item because they are the most important. Now, that doesn't mean that the other items on the list are not important. Doesn't mean that at all. They are important. It just means that the first and the last are the most important important. 
I also, as I said, got halfway through the second characteristic on the list, which is kindness. Paul said, love is kind. And I explained what kindness is from a biblical perspective. Sometimes what we think kindness is and what the Bible thinks kindness is, is two totally different things. It's, it's that way with most terms. So I explained what kindness is from the Bible's perspective. And then I showed you why kindness is so important to relationships. And I used marriage as an example. And that's about as far as we got last week. So let me show you why kindness is so important when it comes to relationships, especially marriage. Now I mentioned this first one last week, but I'm going to go over it again to make sure that we keep the rhythm. First of all, kindness is important to your marriage because it brings encouragement into your home. Turn to Psalms chapter 10, verse number 17, and I'll show you what I'm talking about. Notice what it says. You hear, O Lord, the desire of the afflicted. Oh, he does. Most of us don't pray until we're afflicted. We have some type of trouble, we have some type of problem, and then we go to God. Truth of the matter is, we're nothing but whiners. Oh God! But notice, you hear, O oh Lord, all the whiners. No. You hear, O oh Lord, the desires of the afflicted. You encourage them. And you listen to their cry. One of the greatest acts of kindness is to listen to those who are discouraged and then encourage them. But what is encouragement? Well, I told you last week. Our word encouragement is actually a compound word, which simply means it's made up of more than one word. In this case, it's made up of two words. The prefix in, E-N, which means in, I-N. It's just spelled differently. But in means in. And the word courage. Now, when you combine these two words, it literally means to place courage within someone through positive affirmation, and sometimes negative affirmation. I'm adding that because many times we think that all encouragement is, is flowery words, building people up. Not always. If you've played sports, you understand what I'm talking about. The way your coach encourages you is not the way your mama does. Everyone with me? All right. So what you're doing when you're encouraging them is you're giving them the courage to keep going, to not give up. You see, whenever a person is discouraged, they're ready to give up. What they really need is for someone to listen to them and then to instill courage within them to keep going. Listen to me, a healthy home is a home where there is continual encouragement. And again, we talked about how often should we encourage those in our home. Well, Hebrews chapter 3, verse number 13 tells us, but encourage one another daily, as long as it's called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Now, most of us just look at the first part of that verse, and we miss the last part. But here's what the last part's telling us, and it's what most people don't realize. Discouragement leads us away from God. Discouragement hardens us and keeps us from doing what's not only right, but what's good for us. You get discouraged with your marriage, your job, your life, and what do you do? You quit trying. You get hard. And what do you say? I just don't care anymore. Encouragement stops discouragement and it keeps people on the right road to blessings. It keeps them on the right track with God. It keeps them from ruining their lives. Sometimes the most kind thing that we can do is listen to and be sympathetic and encourage someone. Now, as I said, words of encouragement are not always nice and sweet. Sometimes they're a constructive rebuke. One of the things I always heard from my dad as encouragement was, son, you know better than that. Have you ever said that to your children? You know better than that. You're a Nolan. You get in there and you get it done. Yeah. You know, I can remember two a days in football. That's back when you had two weeks of two a days. You practiced at 10 o'clock in the morning till noon, and then you came back two o'clock in the afternoon, and you got through when the coach said you were through. And, and let me tell you, back then they didn't know squat. 
They didn't give you water. I'm surprised people didn't die. I'm serious. They would throw ice on the ground. How many older people remember that? Yeah, you're scrambling for ice. I, I, I'm seriously surprised that no one died from heat strokes. But we didn't do that. And we'd be, be running wind sprints and I'd be thinking inside, all I got to do is quit. Why am I doing this? I'd run that wind sprint and I'd turn around and say, just say you're going to quit. All you got to do is say you're going to quit. I'd run that next wind sprint. And by the time it's over, well, that wasn't so bad. But all the way through, you're talking to yourself. But one of the voices that kept ringing in my ear was, you're a Nolan. You got this out. Yeah. That was encouragement to keep going. Now, secondly, kindness is important to your marriage because it brings compassion into your home. Turn to Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 32. Notice what it says. And be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Now, Paul uses the word tender-hearted as a synonym to kindness because kind people are tender-hearted. The truth is, I've never met a kind person that wasn't tender-hearted. People who are not kind are not tender-hearted. That's why Paul uses it as a synonym. In a sense, he's saying the same thing twice, but in a different way. So, what is tender-hearted? Well, the word tender-hearted is translated from the Greek word eusplanknos. Yes, one of those interesting words. Eusplanknos. And eusplanknos is a compound word, which simply means it's made up of more than one word. In this case, it's made up of two words. It's made up of the root word splanknos, which literally means bowels. You had a bowel movement. That's the type of bowels we're talking about, all right? Splanknos means bowels, your gut. It's usually translated as passions or strong emotions because the bowels were seen as the seat of the violent passage, passions such as anger, lust, love, or sometimes grief. In fact, let me explain why bowels were seen as the seat of the violent passions. When Micah Joy was in middle school, she went on her first mission trip to Mexico. Alan Leger was the youth pastor at the time, and they were crossing over into Mexico uh, as part of the mission trip. And he was supposed to call, and for some reason he wasn't able to call. And so Lisa and I go home from work. We drive into the driveway. And as soon as we get in the driveway, Macy comes out the front door, and she is just sobbing. She can't hardly get any words out, and all she says is, Dead. As soon as she said, dead, I cannot explain what happened inside my stomach. Because my first thought is, something happened and Micah is dead. And so, Lisa doesn't jump to conclusions like me. She says, honey, who's dead? And she finally gets out, Petey. Petey was her guinea pig. <laughs> I wanted to tear that guinea pig apart. I'll show you, Dad. <laughs> Do you know what you did to me? Well, I didn't say anything. Of course, we held a little funeral. She wanted me to say a few words. <laughs> I did for her sake. But some of you have lost children. And I cannot imagine how that feels. Because I only had one second where I thought maybe my child was dead. But I can tell you, it hit me in the gut and I was sick. There was a knot in my stomach. And that's why splangnos actually means bowels. But it refers to the strong passion Emotions, things that are like grief, anger, lust. But that's what splanknos means. So think of splanknos as strong emotions. It's the type of emotions that you feel in your gut. 
just churns you up, all right? Eusplanknos also has a prefix you, which means good. So when you combine these two words, it literally means good, passionate emotions. In other words, your strong emotion stirs you to do good to others. That's why we translate it as tenderhearted or compassionate because it stirs you to do good to other people. If you don't have compassion, if you're not tenderhearted, you're not going to do good. That's why TV commercials that are trying to give you, get you to give money are going to show the worst things they can show so that it will stir you up to cause you to give money or to do something. That's what you splanknos means. It means that you're stirred up inside in such a way that it causes you to do good. So the Bible will normally translate you splanknos as either tenderhearted or compassionate. Is everyone with me? So, I want you to notice that Paul used the word tenderhearted as a synonym for kindness. That's because kindness is the result of your emotions stirring you to do good. We're kind to those we have compassion for. Men, one of the greatest ways that you can express kindness in your home is to show compassion. When your child doesn't make the team that they so wanted to, or they didn't get the grades that they wanted to, or they weren't chosen, or they weren't invited to a birthday party, or whatever. When you show compassion, you're showing kindness to your children. Thirdly, Kindness brings forgiveness into your home. Look back at Ephesians 4.32, a very important verse. And be ye kind one to another, Christos. Tenderhearted, you splanknos. Forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath, for, hath forgiven you. Kindness and compassion are synonymous, and compassion leads to forgiveness. I'll be honest with you, it's hard to forgive someone that you don't have compassion for. But it's natural to forgive those we have compassion for. And probably the best example I can give you is the book of Jonah. How many of you have read the book of Jonah before? Great story, but it's really a wonderful lesson in human nature. I encourage you to read the story again. Look for the message that God is trying to give us through the book of Jonah. But one of the things that he's trying to get across to us is what human nature is like. Anyone know why Jonah did not want to go to the Ninevites, to Nineveh, and tell them to repent? Anyone? 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 I'm just teasing. They were the enemies of Israel. Nineveh was the capital of Assyria. The Assyrians later on come in and they're going to take all of northern Israel into captivity. So God wants them to ask forgiveness so he, or to repent and ask for forgiveness so that he won't wipe them out. And Jonah doesn't want to do that. Why? God wants or Jonah wants God to wipe them out. So he runs. We know the story. He's thrown overboard. He says, I'm the one that's caused this storm. Just throw me overboard. They do. He's swallowed by a great fish, a whale, and then he spit up. He goes to Nineveh and he, peach, he, he uh, preaches without compassion. He's telling them to repent. God's judgment is at hand. And sure enough, they repent. And then Jonah's upset. I knew you would do this, God. I knew they would repent, and I know that you're long suffering. And so you find this little store where this gourd grows up, and he has some shade. And then a worm comes, and he eats it, and he goes in, and he's got more compassion for the gourd than he does for people. And God has to rebuke him. That's the story in a nutshell. I'm always telling these stories to my grandkids. And let me tell you the response I get. Why? They're at that age. Everything is, why? Why? Because they're mean. They don't have Jesus. Anyways. 
If you read that, you'll find that the reason Jonah was not forgiving is because he had no compassion for the Assyrians, the Ninevites, the capital of, this, of Assyria. So here's the thing, fathers, mothers, do you want a family that forgives each other? Then you need to instill kindness and compassion in your family. I teach this all the time. We did not allow our children to call each other names. We won't allow our grandchildren to do that. We'll teach them that we're family and nothing is more than important than family. We work together, we help each other, we make personal sacrifices for the good of the family. Nothing is more important than family. I will teach Emmy, if someone jumps on Addie, you jump on them. Addie, if someone jumps on Emmy, I'm just teasing. Be like Jesus, but protect each other. You're just taught that when you grow up in a tight family. And kindness comes out. You want the Waltons? Most of you don't even know who the Waltons are anymore, do you? It used to be a TV show, family during the Depression. But at night, they would always say, Good night, John boy. Good night, Mar Marianne. Good night. And they're all saying this, love you. That's the kind of family I grew up in. <coughs> Kindness brings compassion into the family, which also brings forgiveness. And last but not least, kindness is good for your marriage because it eases burdens in the home. Let me say that again. Kindness is good for your marriage because it eases burdens in the home. This is going to blow you away. At least I think it will blow you away. It might not. Some of you are never blown away, but this blew me away. Turn back to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse number 4. Look at Paul's description of love. Love is patient. Love is kind. The Greek word that's translated as kind in this verse is translated as easy in Matthew chapter 11, verse number 30. Anyone remember what Matthew chapter 11, verse 30 says? It says this, For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Do you see that word easy? That's the same Greek word that Paul used for kind in 1 Corinthians 13, 4. At least, it's the same root word. One's an adjective, one's a verb. That's why the suffix is different. But it's the same root word. So you could translate Matthew chapter 11, verse number 30 as, Christ's yoke is kind. Yeah. Christ's yoke is kind. Now, you won't understand what Jesus is saying if you don't know what a yoke is. So let me explain what a yoke is, or yoke was back then. It's totally different today. But a yoke was a heavy wooden harness that fit over the shoulders of oxen. And it was customary to train a young ox who was inexperienced by putting it in a yoke with an older, experienced ox. The young, inexperienced ox didn't carry the load, but was simply learning how to plow or pull by working alongside the old, experienced ox. Now, Jesus was not saying that we would be free from burdens if we yoked up with him. He didn't say that. But here's what he was saying. He was assuring us that he would be right there beside us pulling the bulk of the load. He's telling us that we just need to walk with him and everything will be all right. Jesus said, my yoke is kind. Easy. Now, let me give you a principle. If you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. Kindness seeks to ease the burden of others. Let me say that again. Kindness seeks to ease the burden of others. It seeks to make other people's burdens light. If we see someone carrying a heavy load, whether it's physically, spiritually, mentally, or emotionally, kindness causes us to step in and lighten the load. It seeks to ease the burden of others. You want a good marriage? Be kind one to another. Your husband having a rough day? 
Seek to help him lighten the burden, ease the burden. What can I do to help? Husbands, the wife now has to get out and make the bacon and cook it up too, right? Right, women? You're doing all of these things. Men, if she's working the same as you're working on the outside, then you have just as much responsibility to carry the load on the inside. Laundry, cleaning the house, all of those things. Do I practice what I preach? No. <laughs> I take care of those little grandkids until they poop their pants. And then it's, Lisa! Lisa! And my excuse is, they're girls, they're not boys. If they were boys, I doubt that would be true. But anyways. <laughs> but I do want you to understand... We have agape love in your home, you're going to have kindness. And kindness helps to ease the burden of others, especially in the home. And parents, you're not doing your children a favor when they don't have chores because we're a family. Nothing's more important than family. We work together. We help each other. We make personal sacrifices for the family. And no, you don't get an allowance if you do that. That's part of being in the family. If you want to give an allowance, that's great. You get an allowance because I'm your parent and I love you. But you will do chores because we're a family. And we seek to ease each other's burdens. We're kind. So when Paul's talking about kindness, women, watch the man. If he wants to serve you all the time, he doesn't serve you, do not marry that man. He does not have kindness. If he had kindness, he would seek to ease your burden. I got two great son-in-laws. I prayed them in. My youngest daughter was engaged to a man that was not that way. I prayed him out. <laughs> I laid on this floor praying. That true? That's true. I want husbands that were kind. Now, what will kindness do to your home? It will cause a complete change for the good. Turn with me, if you would, to the book of Romans, chapter 2, verse number 4. And notice what it says. Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness? In forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that, or not knowing that, the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. Notice that. It's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. Now, if you noticed, I've highlighted that word goodness. You want to know why? That word goodness is the same Greek word for kindness. It's just written as a noun, not a ver as a verb. It's Christos. Same word that Paul used. Christos or Christos. But notice what he says. Kindness leads to repentance. It leads to change. Do you realize that it's the kindness of God that causes you or leads you to repentance? True repentance. There's a godly sorrow and a worldly sorrow. The worldly sorrow is you got caught. Boy, I need help. The godly sorrow is, God, I sinned against you. Whether you get me out of this mess or not, I'm sorry. But you know what makes me serve God? His goodness. You know what's caused me to change? His goodness. His kindness. I tell you this all the time that I'm broken. I'm a broken man. And I'm not a broken man because bad things have happened to me. Though some have. The truth of the matter is I've lived such a blessed life, but I'm a broken man because as a pastor, I've seen all the bad. And I see how good God's been to me. And because God's been so good to me, it has broken me. And it has changed me. And that's what the Bible is saying. 
It's the goodness of God that he sent his only begotten son to die for us. It's the goodness of God that he raised him from the dead so that we could be justified. It's the goodness of God that gave us this grace. God's riches, Christ's spittance. It's his goodness that gave me mercy and I'm not being punished for what I should have been punished for. It's the goodness of God that gave me his word to show me how to succeed. It's the goodness of God that led me to my wife and taught me how to raise my children and taught me how to, how to uh, use my finances. And I look at this, all I can tell you is God is good all the time. And all the time God is good. Yeah. All right. Your home need a change? Then you need to instill some kindness. Now we're going to look at the third characteristic of love on the list. And we got to move fast. Okay. Gosh, you guys, you just pull things out and it's your fault. Look back at verse 4. Love is patient, love is kind, and is not jealous. Love is not jealous. Now I want you to notice that Paul changes tactics as he describes what love is. He began by describing love in a positive manner. Love is patient. Love is kind. But then Paul switched and he began describing love in a negative manner. He started explaining what love is not. You see, sometimes it's easier to describe something by telling you what it's not than it is by telling you what it is. How many of you ladies, before you were married, made a list of what you wanted in a husband? Just say it. Maybe you didn't get it, but just raise your hand. How many of you made a list of what, what you wanted in a husband? Men usually don't do that. It's pretty simple. Good looking and foxy. No, I'm just teasing. Women, it's different. How many, seriously, how many of you made a list of the type of husband you wanted? These are the things I want in a husband. Some of you probably said, well, I want a husband that's tall, dark, and handsome. And God, it would be nice if he was rich. And then you went further. Not stingy, jealous, or abusive. Now I want you to notice that halfway through your list, you changed from listing what you wanted to listing what you didn't want. People, that's perfectly normal and that's good. Because if you're out on a date and the person you're on the date with exhibits any of the things that you don't want in a mate, then you drop his butt immediately. Because you spend enough time with him, you'll marry. Some of you older women can name in that. I'm just teasing. You see, to really know what you want in a husband, you also have to know what you don't want in a husband. You have to know what you don't want. So if you see it, you can say, that's not the type of husband I want. Likewise, to really understand what love is, you need to know what it's not. Does that make sense? In this list, Paul is going to list eight things that love is not. So eight, he's going to say love is, and eight things he's going to say love is not. Is there tissue right there? Thank you. Sorry. If they get a close-up of me, my nose will glisten. So anyways, he's going to list eight things that love is not. Now, we're looking at the very first negative characteristic mentioned. Love is not jealous. I want you to underline that word jealous in verse number four. Love is patient, love is kind, and it is not jealous. Jealous is translated from the Greek word zelao. Zelao. And it can mean to be jealous or to be envious. In other words, it can mean either one. To be envious or to be jealous. Notice that the New American Standard translates this, is not jealous. It says love is patient, love is kind, it is not jealous. The King James Version doesn't translate it that way. It translates it this way. Charity, which is love, agape, suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Same thing, right? Wrong. No. Though envy and jealousy are synonyms, there is a subtle difference. And you need to know the difference. In fact, let me define each term and let's see if you notice the difference. Here's envy. Envy wants what someone else has. 
I'm envious of what you have. You have such a nice house with a swimming pool. I want what you have. That's envious. Jealousy is afraid that what one has will be taken away by someone else. If your girlfriend is flirting with someone, you're jealous because what you're afraid is she likes that other boy better and he will take her away from you and she won't be your girlfriend anymore. Everyone with me? So envy wants what someone else has. Jealousy is afraid that what one has will be taken away by someone else. Now, we've used these words as synonyms for so long that we don't make a distinction anymore. But there is a difference if we use the words correctly. Hopefully you see the difference. Now, either translation is right, the King James Version and the New American Standard, because zelao can mean either one. Love is not envious of others, and love is not jealous. Now, obviously, love is not jealous or envious because love always benefits others. It's always beneficial, in other words. But jealousy and envy are detrimental to relationships. Everyone with me? Yeah. Now, let me show you why jealousy and envy are so dangerous to relationships. First of all, envy and jealousy makes us mean. I don't know how else to say it. But we do mean things. Women, you know this better than men. How many of you ever went to school with someone you said they were part of the mean girls? Yeah, girls can be mean too. But when I say mean, it causes us to do things we normally wouldn't do. Turn with me, if you would, to 1 Samuel chapter 18, verses 7 through 11. Notice what it says. This was their song. Saul has killed his thousands and David his ten thousands. This made Saul very angry. What's this, he said. They credit David with 10,000 and me with only thousands. Next, they'll be making him their king. What's he saying? What's he thinking? He's going to take the throne from me. He's going to take what I have from me. Yeah. Is that envy or jealousy? There's a subtle difference. This is jealousy. He could have been envious of the love that people had for David. But in this instance, he's jealous. He's afraid that the throne's going to be taken from him. Notice the next verse. So from that time on, Saul kept a jealous eye on David. He even gets mad at his own son. He says, don't you know he's going to take the kingdom from our family? Yeah. Yeah. The very next day, a tormenting spirit from God overwhelmed Saul, and he began to rave in his house like a madman. He started venting. Yeah. David was playing the harp as he did each day, but Saul had a spear in his hand, and he suddenly hurled it at David, intending to pin him to the wall. In other words, when it says pin him to the wall, it doesn't mean by his his clothes. It means he meant to drive it through his heart. Pin him to the wall. But David escaped him twice. People saw was jealous of David. Jonathan wasn't. You'll find that in 1 Samuel chapter 20, 30, 31, chapter 23, verse 16, 18. But you need to understand that Saul's jealousy consumed him until he was capable of murder. Now, just in case you think it won't happen to you, it will. If you become jealous or envious... It will do the very same thing to you. Notice what James wrote in chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. What causes the quarrels and fights among you? Don't they come from the evil desires at war within you? What are these desires? You want what you don't have. What is that? I gave you the definition. You want what you don't have. Envy. You're envious of others. So you scheme and kill to get it. You're jealous of what others have, but you can't get it. You think that that should be translated as envy, but jealous is good there, and I'll tell you why. The reason it's jealous is what you're thinking is that should be mine. They have what I should have. 
Maybe you were the starting quarterback until a new kid moved into town and he's a better quarterback. And you can't stand that kid. You're jealous of him. Why? Because he took what was yours that should be yours. You should be most popular in the classroom. You should be this. You should be that. Oh, yeah, that's jealous. But you can't get it. Can't be a better quarterback than him. Can't be a better guard than him. Can't be a better whatever. So you fight and wage war to take it away from them. Yet you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. And that doesn't mean that God will always ask, give you what you ask, but he'll change the desires of your heart. God's good about that. So let me give you a principle. If you're taking notes, write this down. Principles you live by. Envy and jealousy opens the door to all kinds of sin. Envy and jealousy opens the door to all kinds of sin. This brings us to the second reason envy and jealousy are so dangerous to relationship. It destroys trust. Let me explain why jealousy destroys trust. The key component in any healthy relationship is trust. Let me say that again. The key component in any, not just marriage, in any healthy relationship is trust. In fact, you cannot have a good relationship with anyone without trust. Trust is so vital to a relationship that it's the basis of all covenant relationships. And again, I'm going to use marriage as an example because it's such a great example. The only thing that holds a married couple together is trust. They trust that the other one will keep the vows they made before God. I want you to listen to vows. These are the vows that I normally use when I'm officiating a wedding ceremony. There are many variations of this, but they'll be very similar to it, and these are based on Scripture. Here's what it says, talking to the wife or to the woman. Do you take this man to be your lawful husband, wedded husband, and do you solemnly promise before God and these witnesses that you will love, honor, and keep him for richer, for poor, in sickness and in health, and forsaking all others, Keep thee only unto him so long as you both shall live. And she says, yes, I do. So I turn to the man and I ask the same thing. Do you take this woman? Do you be a lawfully wedded wife? And do you solemnly promise before God? And I go through it all and he says, I do. Notice what you're promising. You're making a vow to love, honor, and keep your spouse in good times and bad, in sickness and in health, and you're vowing to have no extramarital affairs of any kind as long as you both shall live. You're going to keep the only to him or to her. Now, the only thing that binds you together in this covenant relationship are the vows that you made before God. You trust that your spouse will be faithful to their vow. Now, my whole marriage is based on trust. I trust that Lisa will, will do all these things in good times and bad. And there's been good times and bad. In sickness and in health. She nursed me after a triple bypass, two, knees, two uh, knee replacements. I nursed her through a scraped knee and... She didn't get the good end of the deal, but she made a vow. <laughs> let me go a little bit further. Well, I'm not going to do that. I was going to talk about faith, but let me say this. People, this is why jealousy is so dangerous. Jealousy is always caused by a lack of trust. And once trust is destroyed, you no longer have a healthy relationship. This is why infidelity cannot be, tr cannot be tolerated in a marriage. It undermines the whole basis of a covenant relationship, which is trust. I want you to notice what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 19, verse 9. Notice this. And I tell you this, whoever divorces his wife and marries someone else commits adultery. Unless, caveat here, exception, his wife has been unfaithful. Now, at that point, do you know why God gives a way out? 
because some people can never trust again. And as a result of that, they can never have that right relationship. But it doesn't have to end the relationship. I've seen a lot of relationships where there was infidelity and the marriage became better because the other spouse chose to forgive, but more importantly, they rebuilt trust. Anyone that's ever survived that will tell you trust has to be rebuilt. You want a good marriage? Trust has to be rebuilt. Why? Because trust is the foundation of any healthy relationship. You see, true love is not jealous, neither does it give others a cause to be jealous. So jealousy tears relationship too by destroying trust. Do you realize that envy and jealousy do nothing but make us miserable? Let me just read a scripture real fast. Proverbs 14.30 says, A peaceful heart leads to a healthy body. Jealousy is like cancer in the bones. Wow. Do you guys know what the remedy for jealousy is and for envy? I shouldn't say jealousy. For envy. I just told you about jealousy. You know what the remedy for envy is? It's contentment. I'm going to read one more verse. Spound on it, we'll quit. Look at Philippians chapter 4, verse 11. Not that I was ever in need, for I've learned how to be content with whatever I have. You see, we can never be happy for the success of others until we're content with our own success. Whenever I see a man who's not content with his life, I see future marriage problems. You want to know why? That man will start blaming his spouse for his unhappiness. How many of you watched The Crown on Netflix? I want you to watch that. We couldn't find anything good on TV, which actually equates to, we turned to IMDB and it says nudity, nudity. We don't watch any of that. So it really narrows it down. And so someone said, try The Crown. It's pretty clean. So we tried The Crown. And it's about, of course, the royal family in England. And it traces Elizabeth coming up, but it gets to the part of Charles and Diana. You want to know why the Charles and Diana's marriage never worked? Because he was jealous of Diana. Charles was. That's why he ended up with an old frumpy woman. <laughs> Seriously. As this young, beautiful woman, but he's jealous of her. Just watch it. You know what he's jealous of? She's taking his popularity away. They go out. And he just looks like what he is, Charles. <laughs> Ugly, socially awkward, all of those things. No one likes him. Diana comes in and I'm telling you, everyone just loves her. And you think he would be happy, but he's not. He's jealous because she's taking what he thinks is rightfully is. I'm the prince. I'm the future king. And you know why he ends up with the woman he does? Because she's no threat. Yeah. Envy did that. Jealousy and envy will ruin all relationships. So Paul comes along and the very first negative that he gives you is love is not jealous. And it could be translated either love is not envious. But it means both. Love is not jealous or envious. Because if you have that in a relationship... It's not love. In fact, it will tear the relationship apart. Let's stand. Sorry, I didn't finish the sermon. There's more to it, but we won't finish it because we got to move on. Lord, we'll never get through love if we don't do that. It seems so simple. But it's so hard because of what's inside of us, that atomic nature. But let me tell you what's wonderful. One day, Jesus is going to return. And the dead in Christ, their bodies will be resurrected and reunited with their soul. These resurrected bodies, extra dimensional bodies. And then if we're alive when that takes place, our bodies are going to be transformed but what's great about it is, and most people don't understand this, 
There will be no atomic nature when that happens. We're transformed. See, Jesus came and he initiated the new covenant, but we're in this dispensation where it's now but not yet. We're in the new covenant, but it's not being consummated. So we're living in this sin body that has an atomic nature, and this atomic nature is everything that's against the God kind of love. But one day when Jesus returns, and my body's transformed, what Jeremiah was talking about, and Ezekiel was talking about, and Isaiah was talking about, this new covenant is consummated. And this body's transformed. I'll no longer have an atomic nature. All these things that Paul wrote about would just be in us. We'll love the way we're supposed to love. But until that time, the Holy Spirit's inside of us, working with us and working on us, transforming us from glory to glory. But it starts with Jesus Christ. Because without Jesus, there's not going to be a transformation. You can work as hard as you want, but you need the power of the Holy Spirit to do that. And that only comes when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. So if you're here this morning and never received Jesus, let me just tell you, unless your temperament is just exceptionally good, unless your personality is you're a server, my wife would be good whether she was saved or not. She's just made everything excellent by what the Holy Spirit does with her. Me, I'm a holy terror. Thank God for Jesus and the Holy Spirit. You need that. And if you're here and you don't have Jesus, I'm going to make it simple. I'm going to say a really simple prayer. If you want to receive Jesus, you just say this prayer. Don't even have to say it out loud. You can say it silently to yourself. I want everyone just to bow their heads, close their eyes. If you want Jesus, just repeat this prayer after me. God, I know I'm a sinner, and I know that my sin has separated me from you. But God, I believe you love me. And because you love me, you sent your son Jesus to die for my sin. And I believe that when Jesus died, his soul went to hell and paid the penalty for my sin. But God, I also believe that when all of my sin was paid for, you raised Jesus from the dead. Jesus, I want you. I need your promise to change me, to transform me, even now while I'm living on this earth. But ultimately when you return, and I'll be set free from this atomic nature. Jesus, I want you to be Lord of my life. I want you to save me. Thank you for doing that. Now with every head bowed, every eye closed, if you said that prayer for the first time, I want you to confess that you said that prayer. I'm not going to embarrass you and ask you to come forward. won't send anyone to you. All I'm asking you to do is raise your hand real high right now. See the hand right there. See the hand right there. Anyone else? See the hand there. See the hand back in the back there. Anyone else? Best decision you'll ever make. That's three. Anyone else? All right, let's give them a hand. Bobby, 